And the number three is not inspired of God. It was put in there by men to help us find our places in the Bible. And it's been very beneficial to the church. Sometimes they did it wrong, but most of the time they got it right. And in chapter 2 and verse 46, And they continuing daily with one accord in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, I believe that was the Lord's Supper, and did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. I believe that was eating their regular meals. Praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. The reason I wanted to back up, I want you to understand that what we're fixing to read is exclusively of God. Peter and John did not go to the temple to heal this man. This man did not expect to be healed. They gave him what they did not have. He received that for which he did not ask. There was four of them went up to the temple that day. Peter, John, the lame man, and the Holy Ghost. And the Holy Ghost was the only one who knew what was going to happen. But the Holy Spirit in chapter 2 verse 46 you can see was leading them to go and there it is daily. The word daily is in verse 46. The word daily is in verse 47. You've got to get that. You don't have the understanding of this event except you understand that this was exclusively in the hands of the Holy Ghost. Another thing that I want to see before I show you what I want to show you is in verse number 40 and with many other words did he who was that who was preaching on Pentecost Peter. Peter and with many other words did Peter testify and exhort saying and it goes on to say what he said all right do you know all the words that Peter said on Pentecost no how many sermons do you have in your Bible that Peter preached on Pentecost one but there were many other words okay you just got one all right look in verse 43 and fear came upon every soul and many and many and and, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles how many signs and wonders do you know about we fixing to hear one the holy ghost selected the sermon that you have in your lap it had always been in my mind that that's all that was preached, but I didn't read my Bible like I should have because it says in verse 40, you couldn't get Peter to shut up. He kept on preaching all day long. But Luke only wrote down and could only have dictated to him by the Holy Spirit this one message, which is enough for us. But he wants you to know that that's not all there was to it. There's more of God than you can testify about. God is bigger than your overcoat. Amen. Listen, you ain't got enough vessels for God to fill all up uh, and, and, and He ain't coming nowhere near emptying Himself doing it. <clears throat> so there were many other words, but you get one sermon. And there were many signs of wonders, but we don't get but one. I want you to understand this. By these two things that I have already said, they went up daily by the Holy Ghost. There were many words. You get one. The Holy Spirit reserved you one. There are many signs and wonders. You get one. I want you to understand this. This is not dead religious history. Amen. In your Bible, before Acts chapter 1 and verse 1, the title of this book is wrong. It is not the Acts of the Apostles. It is the Acts of the Holy Ghost. Now, if you want to be an old deadhead religionist, you can stick with all that other stuff. But you're going to hurt your soul if you don't open your mind and listen to what God's trying to help you hear this morning. All right, what's the first word in chapter 3 and verse 1? When? After the Holy Ghost had made it their, made it, uh, their routine to go up to the temple every day. And I want you to understand something else. We don't know how in the world this man sitting in the beautiful gate 
didn't get healed on the day of Pentecost? How come he didn't get saved? You say, how do you know he wasn't saved? Because the Bible says in Acts 3.16 that Jesus just now gave him faith. How in the world could they have been the most powerful presence of God on planet earth with 17 nations of devout men? Acts 2, 5. <coughs> devout men dwelling at Jerusalem. I'm sure this fellow, the lame man, came home with more money than he had ever had. Because when visitors come to a town, and come to the meeting. They're just happy to be there. And they say look. Here's something I can do for somebody. And I bet you he went home with more money. In these days of Pentecost. Than he ever had before. But he didn't go home saved. And he didn't walk home. Don't give up on God. Everybody else. May be jumping up and down, hollering amen, wiping tears from their eyes, waving their handkerchief and praising God and you sitting there like a stump. God's just going to make something special for you. Why don't you wait on the Lord and renew your strength? Why don't you understand the Lord waiteth to be gracious to you? There was one other man got messed up at that temple. He was a eunuch. And he had traveled all the way from way over yonder to Jerusalem. One lifetime trip. That's all he got. And when he got there, the temple veil was tore. And he didn't get nothing out of church. He was trying to read his Bible. He couldn't understand that on the way home from church that morning. And God said, Philip, get down yonder and explain to that man what this is all about. And he opened the Bible at Isaiah 53 and preached unto him Jesus. And that eunuch got more going home from church than he got at church. Is anybody in here listening to me? You and your religion ain't going to contain all of God. The heavens and heavens of heavens cannot contain him. And dear soul, me and you and us Baptists, we ain't going to put God in no box. You have to understand God is spirit and they that worship him must. God will on purpose do stuff to mess you up because we need to be messed up because our minds are locked in to Baptist tradition. The Baptist didn't save you. Jesus saved you. Now there's a word on that sign out there that I ain't going to take off. It says Grace Baptist Church. And I'm staying right where I am because I ain't seen nothing else no better. But it ain't good as it ought to be. But I want you to understand the Holy Spirit is dealing here. And this man went through all the glories of Pentecost. He didn't get nothing. In verse 46, they continued daily. In verse 47, the Lord added daily. And while that was going on, right then, now is when Peter and John went up together into the temple. And we answered the question uh, the other night, uh, 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 how in the world could the apostles continue to go to a temple that Jesus had already cursed? I ain't going to give you the answer. You should have been here. Went up into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. And a what kind of man? A certain man. I certainly know God picked out this man. And one thing he did was keep him from all the blessings. Kept him crippled. Kept him dependent. Kept him isolated from society. He heard something down the street. Something going on at Pentecost. So they said they were speaking in different languages. He couldn't go down there and see. He just had to sit right there where he was. And dear soul, the Bible said that if you would learn something, 
Solomon has mobility. He can go anywhere he wants to go. He's got chariots, horses, anything he wants. But he said, you know that lily out yonder in the, in the woods? It can't go nowhere. It's stuck. Right there where God planted it is where it's got to stay. And if something's going to bless that lily, it's got to come to it. And he says, Solomon in all of his glory is not as pretty to me as that one little lily. It can't go to Home Depot and get some fertilizer. It can't move over to get the rain with that tree of blocking it up there. It's just got to stand right where it is and wait on God to come by. Anybody here like that? You better hold your place. Because the times before appointed and the bounds of your habitation have been established by God and you're in the best place and at the best time for God to come walking down your road and when he does, you're going to like it and you ain't going to worry about what everybody else got on Pentecost because you and Jesus has got a personal relationship going on after that. Amen. Folks, I'd rather, be, I'd, I'd rather have Jesus than the fellowship of every Baptist preacher in the world. Amen. Even the good ones. Now, Peter and John went up to the temple. And a certain man. Now, we're going to make it as bad as we can. Lame from his mother's womb. Now, if he fell off his horse and broke his leg, that might have been something different. If he, if he just got polio at a later age in his life and, and he was on, on crutches with braces, that might have been something different. But this was what we call an accident of nature. This man didn't even have what he needed to even have as good a legs as a man with polio does. He just didn't have anything at all. And it wasn't put there for him from the very beginning. When God formed him in the womb, God said, hold that back right there. Don't give it to him. And from his waist down, he was useless. Now, let me show you another daily. Acts chapter 3, verse 2. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, and King James misses it right here. The inner linear says was being carried so that makes us understand that here comes Peter and John one way and here comes this lame man being carried the other way at the same time they all got there together <clears throat> they're going up daily and a certain man lame from his mother's womb was being carried whom they Laid how often? Amen. Daily. At the gate, here we go again, of the temple, which is called beautiful, to ask mercy. What does your Bible say? To ask what? Look at Luke 150. Luke chapter 1. And verse number 50. Luke 1 50 and holy is his name third word in verse 50 and his mercy. that's it that's the same word and his alms his mercy is on them that fear him from generation to generation look at Jude verse 21 Jude verse 21 Right before the book of the Revelation. Building up yourselves on the most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, verse 21. Keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy. mercy. There it is. You are right now to be looking for alms from God. Are you walking in the Spirit? You say, I want to. What's the problem why you don't walk in the Spirit all the time? My flesh. Hmm. Oh, that which was born of your mama, right? So you're telling me you're lame from your mother's womb. Yeah? Yeah. 
And any time I don't walk like I should for God, you can lay it to my stinking flesh. For that which is born of the flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the spirit is spirit. So the Bible said that the, the alms that he was looking for was a mercy. And the Bible said that we are to uh, build ourselves up in the most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. We are to keep ourselves in the love of God. And we are to continuously look for the alms, for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. You say, well, God's already given me eternal life. Well, how come you're still here? You ain't in eternity. You're on your way to eternal life. You got some life to go to life in, but it's going to be eternal, but you ain't there yet. So while you're here on this earth and while your flesh is giving you trouble, that which was formed in your mother's womb, that which is born of old fallen Adam uh, is giving you trouble. And, and, and you're, having, uh, you're having to help that flesh and lay it daily before Christ. You're having to drag that flesh to church. You're having to bring it up here to this beautiful gate. You're having to make that flesh listen and be quiet and pay attention. And that's my brain in there, not yours. Quit showing me pictures of something else. Out yonder tomorrow or yesterday. That's my brain. Transform yourself by the renewing of your mind. You're working against that flesh. You're dragging that flesh in here and laying it down before the gate, beautiful, and saying, God have mercy. Give me an alms. Amen. Amen. It was a certain man. Yeah. Whom they lay daily. Wait, wait a minute. They lay daily. Hey, Joe, listen. How about meeting us down, down yonder at the racetrack? We're going to races tomorrow. Well, I can't. i got to go lay my brother at the gate. Beautiful. I'll be there later, but I can't. These people were not expecting him to be healed. I'm going to tell you something, friends. Salvation is 100,000% of God. God alone. I didn't want no new heart till I already had one. No sinner does. And until God Almighty quickens you. And you know what? He 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 run old Saul right into the very face of Samuel the prophet when he wasn't doing nothing but looking for his daddy's lost mules. The mules got out. Go find the mules. Going looking for the mules run smack into Samuel. The woman from Zarephath, she wasn't doing nothing but picking up sticks, not firewood. Sticks. She didn't have enough meal for firewood. All she needed was a few sticks. It wasn't going to make but one cake. And while she's picking up sticks, she runs smack into Elijah the prophet. You are where you are doing what you're doing. It may be mundane. It may be aggravating. It may seem like you're dragging the flesh around. It may not seem like God's a million miles away. It may seem like ain't nothing going on. But the Holy Ghost has got something planned for you. And if you'll be faithful and be still and be quiet and be patient and wait on the Lord, God will intersect you. And you will know. And you won't have to be taught. It's not of the works of righteousness which we have done. You'll know that. Because I didn't do nothing but receive it. Because Jesus Christ is a gift. Faith is a gift. What do you do with a gift? You just receive it. That's all you can do. Amen? Listen. They lay daily. So there was really more than four people. I don't know how many it took to carry him there, but there was four guys that had a man on a cot that let, lowered him down after they tore up that fellow's roof. I wonder if he had home insurance. Anyhow, ever how many it took to carry him, it was them, the lame man, Peter and John, and the Holy Ghost. And nobody expected anything to happen except the Holy Ghost. Can't go with you tomorrow, Joe. I got to carry my brother back to the temple. 
Why are, you, why are you planning on carrying him back to the temple tomorrow? Because he's lame. Not a thought in his head about the man going to be able to jump higher, leap longer, and praise God better than the folks that carried him in. Folk, you don't know what God's doing. You just do what you're supposed to do. Amen. Pick up your sticks. Go look for the mules. Do what God said. Who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the... See, they all got there together. They wasn't in the temple yet. They was about to go in the temple. He asked a mercy. And Peter... Now, the second word in verse 3 is seeing. It just says he saw it. He didn't see a healer. He didn't see two apostles. He just saw two guys walking. And to him, and in his afflicted mentality, anybody that's walking owes him money. If you can walk around, you can work on a job, and you ought to be able to give me something. So he had evidently been faring so well with 17 nations of Jews. I mean, they got to have some money to get there. And you know the motels all run up and double their prices in Jerusalem to, uh, during the Passover. They always do that. And so he had really been raking it in. So here come Peter and John and seeing them. What did he see? Dollar signs. Yeah. But Peter did more than see him. Listen. And Peter, fastening his eyes upon him, and here's the clincher, next two words. And Peter, fastening his eyes upon him, next two words. What does that mean? It means John's eyes were fastened on him, just like Peter's. That's when the miracle started. When a cold-hearted religionist is going to church at the ninth hour because it is the hour of prayer, he ain't got nothing on his mind but going in there praying. Well, as soon as we get out of this, we'll all meet at Shona's. Then we get out of here, we're all going to Outback, whatever, you know. But we got to go up to the temple the ninth hour. That's when you're supposed to pray. That's when Cornelius prayed. That's when they prayed. Where did they pray? At the temple. When? Daily. Why? That's just the way it was. That's just the way we've always done it. Tradition. But the Holy Ghost cuts in right here. And he's got two boys that he's going to save time and time again from religion. Thank you, Lord, for saving me from religion every day. I need it. And Peter fastening his eyes upon him with John said one of the dumbest things you've ever heard because the first two words of verse 3 says who seeing he was already seeing them Peter says look on us. Look on us. Dear soul, he wanted him to do more than just look. Now, that first word, seeing, is the same thing in Matthew 2 and verse 2. The wise men said, we have seen, and what did they see? His star in the east. Well, I just looked up there and there was a star and that's what I saw. The same word. There's two men. Look like they're good, uh, uh, you know, healthy men. They probably got some money, and I'm going to get some money from them. That's all he saw. But, Peter, but it says, Peter fastening his eyes upon him with John, it means to behold earnestly. Peter had had himself arrested by the Holy Ghost 
The fires of supernatural mercy and almsgiving had welled up in his soul and had overcome the guilt that he might feel in not being able to give this man a piece of gold or a piece of silver. But he knew he had something now more to give the man than what the man expected. In chapter 11 and verse number 6, let me show you Peter doing this again. Chapter 11 and verse number 6. Chapter 11 and verse number 6. He's telling about the sheep being let down from heaven and rise and killing eat. And he says, Upon the which when I had fastened mine eyes, there it is. When I had fastened mine eyes, this is what he's saying happened to him. He fastened his eyes upon him with John fastening John's eyes upon him. God is moving now upon that which was dead. The Spirit of God is moving upon the face of the deep. The depth of religion is unbelievable. There's all kinds of religion on the face of this earth. And mine and yours is not any different apart from the Holy Ghost. I was going to hell with a Baptist religion apart from the Holy Ghost for seven years. And then God moved upon my heart and got my attention. And I ain't never let him forget it. So it says Peter fastened his eyes upon the man like Peter fastened his eyes upon the sheet. And he says... I was in the city of Joppa praying. That's what he was going to do in the temple. And in Acts 11, 5, he said, And in a trance, I saw a vision. And in verse 6, he said, I fastened my eyes upon it. There was something supernatural that had occurred to Peter that he had never thought of on his way to the temple that day. I like it when God's got plans that I didn't even know about. I don't know whether they ever got to pray or not. Man, jumping all over him time he got through. And stirred up a big muckety muck. And so we see that he fastened his eyes upon him just like he did in the vision. Look at 13.9. Paul did the same thing. Had the same thing happen to him. They had this sorcerer that was just about to drive them nuts. In 13.6, uh, they were the, on the Isle uh, of Papyrus. They found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew whose name was Bar-Jesus. So the sorcerer withstood them, seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith in verse 8. And, 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 and look at verse 9. Then Saul, who also is called Paul, read me the next phrase, the next five words. All right, you got it? Filled with the Holy Ghost. Now, what's the rest of the verse? We ain't talking about Peter looking at the man like the man looked at him. We're talking about Peter looking at the man like Peter knows God is looking through his eyes. Like God is looking through Peter's eyes. Like God is looking through John's eyes. All of a sudden, their minds, their spirit, their emotions, their thoughts, are all, they're all arrested by the Holy Ghost. And God said, get out of the way. Your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost. I'm going to fill my temple and I want you to do what I'm fixing to tell you to do. And right there is where the Holy Ghost jumped in this thing and got started. Amen. So it's like when Paul said, I've had enough of you. And he was filled with the Holy Ghost and set his eyes upon him. And he cursed him as a child of the devil in verse 10. And, 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 and he said, uh, will thou not cease to pervert the right ways of God? And, and uh, said, you're going to be blind and not seeing the sun for a season. Immediately there fell on him a mist of darkness. It, it's the same song, but it's a different verse. Listen, he set his eyes upon him and cursed him and God smote him into blindness. Uh, in our case, Peter and John fastened their eyes upon him and God blessed him and gave him his, his, uh, his walk back, not only uh, physical, but also spiritual. 
So he set his eyes upon it. Not to belabor the point, but let me give you this. You can jot it down. We don't have to turn to it. 2 Corinthians 3, verse 7 and 13. The children of Israel could not, and I quote, steadfastly behold Moses' face. That word, steadfastly behold, and, and setting their eyes upon, is the same thing here in Acts chapter 3 and verse 4. And Peter fastening his eyes. That's the phrase. Have you ever been riding down the road with your kids in the back seat? Headed to vacation. And y'all say, look yonder, there's an eagle's nest. Look at that thing up there in that tree. And, and or look look yonder, there's a, a spotted cow. And they look out the wrong side of the car. <laughs> and you try to turn no other side. And then they're looking back this way. They're looking at the right side, but they're looking back towards the rear tire. No, and you and you can even turn their face toward it, and they still their eyes are going the wrong way. They're so you can't no more set your eyes uh, in, in a way of absolute sovereign glory for the purpose of sovereign glory then you can get your kids to see a, a spotted cow riding down the road. God has to set your eyes and make you see listen, while we look not at the things which are seen but we look at the things which are not seen 2 Corinthians 4.18 That's the way Christians look. He that seeth the Son and believeth on Him hath life. John 6.40 yeah. <clears throat> It has to be a work of the Holy Ghost for you to see, perceive, discern, understand, contemplate. To, to have the Scriptures open to you and your heart open to the Scriptures. Did not our hearts burn within us while He opened to us the Scriptures by the way? What are you talking about? I was walking with you and I didn't see nothing, hear nothing. You didn't have your eyes opened by God the Holy Ghost. This is where the miracle started. And in verse 4, Peter says, Look on us. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. What do you mean, look on us? This man was fixing to look into the eyes of glory. Moses said, Lord, show me your glory. He said, can't do it. I'll show you my mercy. I'll show you my hinder parts, but you can't see my face. Listen, the blood of bulls and goats will not sustain a look into the face of God. The brother preached that this morning. And, and, and until the Lamb of God came and shed His blood, tore the veil, opened to us a new and a living way so that we could come boldly into the presence of God, only then can you see the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So... He was saying, don't just look for a gift. Don't just look for finance. Don't just look for something to aid you in staying in the crippled condition you're in. Dear soul, if a man ever has hope in God, there's no limits to this thing. Most of us just want to let God bless us in our crutches. Throw it away! Look on us! Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. You say, you sound like a faith healer. I don't care what I sound like. I'm preaching the Word of God. You ought to know what I'm talking about. Look, look on us. John 11 and verse 9. John 11. In verse 9. Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in a day? If any man walk in the day, he stumbleth not, because two words. He seeth, John 11, 9, is the exact same word, look on us, 
there in Acts chapter 3 and verse number 4. Now, if he seeth, what did he say he would not do? He stumbleth not. Why? Because he seeth the light of this world. Look back at John chapter 9 and verse 39. This word is all in this verse. John 9, 39. Jesus saith, and Jesus said, For judgment I am come into the world that, here it goes, they which see, you have to leave out the word not, they which see is the same word, look on us. It's the same word in 11.9. He seeth, and therefore he doesn't stumble. Now this man's not ever going to stumble again. <coughs> Why? Because God's going to give him legs to walk right before God. If you blank in the spirit, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. What is it? If you... So this man's going to see for the first time. Yes, he sees Peter and John. Anybody can do that. Wise men saw the star. Well, that's fine. We saw the star. That's it, looking at something. But I ain't talking about looking at something. I'm talking about fastening your eyes upon God. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look, one word. Full in his wonderful face and the things of this world will grow strangely dim. This old, you can turn up the light on the world and it'll dim out Jesus. Or you can look on Jesus and the light turn up on Him and the world will dim out. And the things of this world will grow strangely dim in the light of His glory and His grace. Ain't God good to us? Amen. Ain't God good to us? So John 9, 39 they which see, leave out the word not, and then pick up might see. That's, a, that's again the same word. They which see and might see. Now, do you remember while we're here, John 8, 56. John 8, 56. Just one word. It's not, it's not some super duper word. It's just a little simple word. That you, you, we, we've done said it 15 times already. And it's just a little three a, a letter word, and I'll let you read it. John 8 56. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he, one word, saw. That's it. He saw it and was glad. Now, wait a minute. Did Abraham live in the same day as Jesus? He lived hundreds of years before Christ did then what was it that gave him the ability to look down through the annals of time and see the Messiah? We know that it's with faith we see that which is invisible. That faith causes us to view that which the eyes cannot see. That's what this is talking about. Abraham envisioning by the Holy Ghost the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. When did he see it? <clears throat> he took his son rose up early in the morning had the, had the wood had the knife and had the fire father and son went to the same mount Mount Moriah in the Old Testament is Mount Calvary in the New Testament where father and son would go up to that mount and they would have the wood the cross and the fire of God's justice and the knife of God's judgment was going to drink deeply into the breast of the Lamb of God. And Abraham saw the glory of God in not seeing anything else. Abraham, I know that's your son. I know you waited 14 years for him. I know Ishmael was a great disappointment. And even though he was a knucklehead, you, I, you didn't want to throw him away. And I said, get him out of here because one apple spoils the whole, uh, the whole barrel. Get him out of here. Get him away from Isaac. That's, that's in whom my name is going to be called. That's going to be that seed that's going to bring on Christ. And I know you love him. But until you come to have your eyes filled with God... 
Until you come, dear soul, that everything and everybody else is nothing. Until your eyes, like the, like the, the, the wise being, your eyes are filled with a star and lead you on to the place where the physical, literal child of God is laying. Until you come to the place, dear friend, where you're through with religion, where you're through with the letter of the law that killeth, or where you're through with being proud for memorizing verses in your brain, and you finally got the Word in your heart. You ain't never going to have your eyes filled with the glory of the person of the Word of God. <clears throat> Abraham saw my day. Guess what he did? He rejoiced. This old bird kind of rejoiced too. Man, he was jumping benches. If they'd had any snakes, he'd have handled them. Listen, he was having a Baptist fit. And Abraham did too. He rejoiced to see my day one other first peter chapter one the bible said that moses saw him who was invisible oh my soul saw him who was invisible excuse me first peter chapter one verse eight What's the last two words of verse 7? Jesus Christ, whom having not seen... Next two words, please. In whom, though now ye see him not, yet believing, you love him and you believe him, and the, re and the result is the same as Abraham and the lame man. Ye rejoice... With joy unspeakable and full of glory. Isn't that something? You seen that picture of that man sitting there with a little old loaf of bread and a bowl of soup in front of him? You seen that picture? Most of you got one hanging on your wall somewhere. And the caption reads, All this in Jesus too. Man, a bowl of soup and a piece of bread. That's a steak dinner if you got Jesus in your heart. Why? Because you're rejoicing with joy unspeakable and full of glory. If you ain't got Jesus in your heart, a steak dinner wouldn't be good enough for you. Man, I'd take a soda cracker and a, and a, and a lukewarm glass of water if I had Jesus. Amen? Yeah. A vine of sausage. Watch out now. Watch out now. First Peter 1, I know you literally, physically have not seen him, but you love him. I know by the natural eye you have not observed him, but you believe in him. And I know that you believe in him and that you love him because when I asked you how you're doing, you say, I'm blessed. And you said it limping in the door. That makes me know you've got a life and a world that you dwell in that natural eye can't see. Yeah, right. And Peter said, quit looking at my pocketbook and start looking at my Savior. That's where the wealth is. I want to tell you something, and this didn't discourage you, man. I don't have any silver or gold. He said, but I'm going to give you what I do have. And he didn't have it when he saw the man at first. When they all come together at the temple, at the same time, Peter didn't have it. But when God made him know he had it, he said, I got something to give you that's greater than silver and gold. So the apostles gave the man what they did not have, and he received that for which he did not ask for, which lets you know the Holy Ghost had to be in the whole thing, or everybody would have went home dissatisfied. And that was the last day they carried him to the temple. Hey, Joe, I can meet y'all down yonder now tomorrow because I ain't got to carry my brother to the temple. Really? Is somebody else going to do it for you? No, he don't have to be carried no more. Tell us about it. Here we go. And here comes the testimony. I don't ever have to carry him no more. Dear soul, that which you're depending on, it may have been good for you up to a certain point. But God is jealous for your crutch. You didn't hear that, did you? 
I'm going to drag it by you one more time. God is jealous of your crutch. God is jealous of your caregiver. God is jealous of your financial advisor. And he ain't going to let you go along depending on that for very long before he don't break in on you. And although all you want is a little bit of money to help you stay crippled, he's going to give you a little bit of glory so that you can walk before God all of eternity. Ain't God good? Hallelujah. Boy, I tell you what, if, if I wasn't saved, I, I, I would want to be. I, I sure would want to be. And, and what gets me is these guys were walking up to the temple. And it, it happened in the temple, daily with one accord in the temple. And, and, and into the temple in verse number one. The words the temple is mentioned twice in verse two. And it's mentioned in verse 3, in verse 8, in verse 10. And Solomon's porch is mentioned in verse 11. And I, I want you to understand this, oh, that God can take an old half-baked, reprobate, used-up religion and still get glory out of it. Yeah. <coughs> oh, listen. They was observing a religious tradition that, that that God said he was going to destroy would you look at Luke 17 and verse number 14 Luke 17 and verse 14 does anybody know while you're turning there who Jesus is called, what is his title in Hebrews 8, 1. The first word is high. High priest, high priest right? Yep. So Jesus Christ is the high priest. Now listen to Luke 17, 14. Ten lepers, all ten get healed. Only one gets saved. Listen. And they lifted up their voices in verse 13 of Acts, I mean Luke 17, and said, Jesus, Master, have alms on us. And when he saw them, mm, he said unto them, Go show yourselves unto the priests. Did you say priests? You sound like a snake, didn't you? Priests. Wait a minute. <coughs> This is the high priest. What do you mean, go show yourself? You may still be all tangled up in organized religion. But God can take a crooked stick and draw a straight line with it. Listen, he saved me as a Southern Baptist. But he didn't save me as a Southern Baptist. He saved me as a sinner in the Southern Baptist church. Now, there was a lot of grace boys that I wasn't saved because I wasn't saved under somebody preaching the five points. I didn't even know what the five points were. And Calvin was the guy that worked out at the grocery store that put up stock. But I'm going to tell you something. God saved me in the midst of that, re that religion. He saved me out of it he took me out of it. He took it out of me first and then took me out of it. Amen. And he stuck me back into religion just like he did Moses. He took uh, Moses out of Egypt. Then he took Egypt out of Moses. And then he put Moses back in Egypt to get his people out. Here I am. I don't fit no more. And I'm hollering at everybody I can get who don't fit either to come on, go with me. Go show yourself to the priest. Jesus, the high priest, said that. This man was healed in the temple. And Jesus said, Not one stone going to be left upon another, and this house, the temple, will be left unto you desolate. And the word temple falls off the pages of your Bible after the book of Acts, except in Corinthians, to tell you that your, bo your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost. You don't see it again. Look at Revelation 18 and verse 4. Revelation 18 and verse 4. 
I want you to read me two words in this. We're talking about Babylon. Verse number 2, Revelation 18, 2. He cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, is become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. That's talking about the whore church. Now, listen at verse 4. You read me two people. Two people. Make it two words and one of them is people. Verse 4. And I heard another voice from heaven. You got that? It's a spiritual voice. Saying, come out of her. Two words. Wow. <coughs> People get so worried about stuff. i never seen such different child rearing in this age from anything I've ever seen. They just... They, they wear the kids out, dragging them to every kind of function. Because they don't want them to be, you know, they don't want them to grow up crooked. You know, they, man alive. My mama worked in the mill all day long. My daddy run off with another woman and we was on our own. Uh, all day, she left you an egg on the stove if you wanted it. And mine was usually dry and hard by the time I got up. We just couldn't just eat the middle. The rest of it was already done turned brown. And I'd get myself to school, get myself dressed, go to the paper office after I got out of school, go deliver the papers on the far side of town and ride about 15 miles from the paper route over to where I lived in the federal housing project. And I'd say, hi, Mom. That's the first time I saw her since yesterday. I wonder how in the world God saved me And people today, you know what? The greatest man in the Old Testament was Moses, and God raised him among those who believed in the black arts. I believe y'all do everything y'all do for your kids, but my soul, God's going to fix it one day where you can't do nothing. He's going to separate you from them, and He's going to make sure that you understand it was God that did it and not what you did. I'm going to tell you something. I believe in raise up a child the way he should go in the end he will not depart from it. But that ain't no, that, that ain't, that ain't no club you can have, hold over God's head and say, you've got to save all my kids. I know a lot of people did good with their kids and, and, and they turned out horrible. Hello? God can raise up his people in the midst of a whorish church. God can raise up Moses in the midst of black arts. Dear soul, I want you to understand that every son of God that gets to heaven ain't going to be your son. It's going to be God's son. I don't want to discourage you. But I find that hypocrisy dwells so much among people who's got everything just right. And this is going to work. Dear soul, it may not. And you better be ready for some heartache. And you better be ready for this. You better understand something. God can save them with or without wholesome influence around them. Amen? Amen. Trust in the what? With all your heart. Lean not to your homeschooling. Your perfect habits. You're dragging them to church. Listen. Our hope is in Jesus Christ, period. Amen. Amen. Don't quit homeschooling. Don't quit doing what you're doing. But quit acting like you got some kind of market cornered on God that nobody else has. Amen. <clears throat> I love you. You want to fire me, don't you? <laughs> I've been fired before. Revelation 18.4 and I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. Dear soul, remember this. The things that we do, we do asking God's blessing on it. But God can deal with or without what we do. And I'll tell you this, there's not one 
There's not one trophy. There's not going to be one honors banquet in eternity except for Jesus Christ. Are you listening to me? I'm not trying to discourage you. I'm trying to make sure you don't get caught up in the ways of the world and get hurt. Oh, my soul. How did I get into all that? We was doing good till we run into that, wasn't we? So we say this, old that God used this tradition. Now look, let's finish up. Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10. You remember Cornelius? Here we are doing what we find naturally. <coughs> That's what you're doing. And I'm telling you, God will take care of business in, in whatever you are in, whatever he's called you in. Just make sure you don't try to act like it's what you're doing and not what God's doing through what you're doing. And I wanted to impress upon you in this message that everybody that showed up for temple that afternoon, nobody but the Holy Ghost understood and purposed that this man would walk home of his own uh, strength and his, of his own will. Nobody. God did it. All right, Acts chapter 10. You remember a certain man in Caesarea calls Cornelius, a centurion of the band called the Italian band. He was a devout man, one that feared God with all his house, which gave much mercy, alms to the people and prayed to God always. Now listen. And he saw a vision evidently about the ninth hour, the same hour that Peter and John was going up to the temple. I want to read you this and we'll quit. In verse 9, on the morrow when they, had, when they went on their journey and drew nigh to the city, Peter went up upon the house to pray about the sixth hour. That ain't what I want. Verse 30. And Cornelius said, four days ago I was fasting unto this hour. And at the ninth hour I prayed in my house, and behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing and said, Cornelius, thy prayer is heard, and thine alms are had in remembrance in the sight of God. Dear soul, there was a voice that was going up to God. There was Although it was within traditional religion, although it was Peter and John going to do what they were doing without, first of all, any uh, moving of the Spirit upon them to give that man a single thing because they didn't even have silver and gold. But God Almighty had purposed within that thing that he would use that time before appointed in the bounds of that habitation for his glory. And God will use yours too. Make sure you do it for the glory of God. Listen. And he says about that ninth hour, he said, Thine almsgiving has come up before the Lord. I want you to see, dear soul, in Philippians 4.18, that the almsgiving and the prayers have a voice to God. Of themselves they speak to God. Philippians 4.18 In Philippians chapter 4 and verse 18 But I have all and abound. I am full having received of Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you the things which were sent from you those alms they are an odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God. God is not uh, uh, unrighteous to forget Hebrews 6. Let me read it before I mess it up. Hebrews 6, 10. It says, For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which ye have showed unto his, uh, toward his name, in that ye have ministered to the saints and do minister. That which they were going to do, that almsgiving, that which they were willing to do, it was within that context, dear soul, that God's attention had already been drawn. 
If you have a merciful heart and you have a, an almsgiving soul, if you have a desire for God to use you, those things in themselves are already prayers before Almighty God and you have God's attention. The Holy Ghost was focused upon this scene before Peter and James, excuse me, Peter and John ever knew about it, or especially the lame man. God was drawn to Cornelius' alms giving and his prayers, and he said he prayed about the ninth hour the same as they did, and God's focus was already upon it. I want you to know this pure religion and undefiled before God. You need to keep yourselves from the world and visit the father and the widows and so forth. You need to do those things which are practical. Do those things which you can do. Take care of your kids. Do what you can do. Do all you can do. But expect God to focus upon it in order for it to be blessed. Right. That's all I'm saying. God is not unrighteous. He would have been unrighteous if He had not been focusing on that almsgiving. And it is a sweet odor in the nostrils of the Holy God. Dear soul, you say, well, I'm just going to quit. I'm tired. I do all the giving. They do all the taking. What if you was to quit about 30 minutes before God was going to pour a blessing out all over you? Wouldn't that be bad? And by the way, when, when did he ever quit on you? When did he ever quit on you? He said, I'm the Alpha. I started you off. I'm also what? The Omega. I'll be there to finish it up. Amen? You need to persevere in what you're doing. Dutiful, practical Christianity is beneficial for you and those lame people around you because God is focusing upon that and He will not, He is not unrighteous to forget your work of labor of love. Don't you get tired? You ever get weary of well doing? I do. Sometimes I feel like I'm just burned out. If that phone rings one more time, I'm going to get me a shotgun and blow it to smithereen. But it does. And somehow or another, when I hear the voice on the other end, I hear the Holy, say, Holy Ghost saying, fashion your eyes upon me. And here we go again. I have never been able to exhaust God even with an exhausted soul myself. Some of you came here this morning not expecting to hear or feel or know or see anything from God except a sermon. It may be that God has intersected you already and instead of giving you a sermon, He's given you a message. Amen. And He has encouraged your soul and sparked you to hope and knowing that even though you can't see anything more than being carried and dumped off in the temple again, God has purposed to intersect you right there. Do not give up. Always abounding. Be steadfast and unmovable. Always abounding in the work of the Lord. For you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. 1 Corinthians 15, 58.